Good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the AML webinar presented by the Professional Development Committee in partnership with SGVN Company. May we request everyone to join us in prayer to be followed by the Philippine National Anthem. Heavenly Father, You are our Creator, our Light, our Wisdom and Strength. May we ask for your guiding hand to lead us through this forum today and every day as we accomplish our work and various tasks. We pray for joy, enthusiasm, and fulfillment in our work. May we conduct ourselves and our business dealings in an environment of fairness, respect, and compassion. May we ask you to enter the hearts and minds of our leaders and countrymen. Give them strength, wisdom, so that they may lead us through these difficult times with honesty, integrity, humility, and selflessness. Finally, we pray that you extend your healing hand over us, our families, and our nation, and help us overcome this health crisis that has claimed so many lives, including the lives of many of our friends, family members, and colleagues. Please heal those who are sick and guide the hands and minds of our doctors and nurses as they care for them. All these we humbly pray. Amen.
May call on our host for today. He is the liaison director of the Professional Development Committee, Mr. Ronald Luis Goseco. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the AML offering of the Professional Development Committee of Phoenix. We're very happy to see you all here. Today's webinar is being held in partnership with SGV. At this point, may I call on our chairman. Ms. Edith Pistachio for her opening remarks. Edith. Thank you, Ned, and good afternoon, everyone. A warm welcome and thank you for joining our webinar today. First of all, thank you for attending this last webinar offering of the Professional Development Committee, covering a very exciting and timely topic on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, or AML-CTF. This is a topic that we've actually covered last year, and which was very, very well received by both Phoenix members and non-members alike. This afternoon, we are very honored to have with us Attorney Matthew David, Executive Director of the Anti-Money Laundering Council, or AMLC, and Ms. Veronica Balisi, a partner of SGV and Company, who will be sharing with us the most recent updates on AML-CTF. We are also grateful to have attorney Kimi Ross Linolat of the Compliance Supervision Group of AMLC and attorney Arnold Cabanlit, Acting Deputy Director of the Compliance and Supervision Group of AMLC. They will be joining us later for the Q&A session to be moderated by attorney Carla Frias, Managing Partner at the Bay Law Group. Events like this, where regulators and industry practitioners share updates and experiences is an important way of encouraging learning, collaboration, and compliance. And lastly, let me thank our partner for this webinar, SGV and Company. So thank you, and I hope we all learn from this webinar and enjoy the program today. Back to you, Ned. Thank you, Edith. At this point, allow me to introduce our, our speaker, our first speaker. Our first speaker is Attorney Matthew D David, Executive Director of the Anti-Money Laundering Council. Prior to being the Executive Director, Attorney Matthew served as the Director of the Investigation Enforcement Department of the AMLC Secretariat and as the uh, Deputy Director of the Office of the General Counsel and Legal Services at the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Attorney David holds a Master of Laws degree in Finance from the Institute for Law and Finance at the Gethe Frankfurt University in Germany. He obtained his degrees in Bachelor of Laws and Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of the Philippines in Diliman. And attorney David cannot join us live today, but he sent a recorded presentation. Let us all watch this. Good afternoon. On behalf of the anti money Laundering Council Secretariat, or AMLC, it is my pleasure to be speaking before the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines, or Phoenix, officers and members. As an overview, we will be discussing our country's anti money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, or AMLCTF system, specifically the following five stages of risk-based supervisory framework, and relative to this are the rules of procedure in administrative cases, or RPAC, and enforcement action guidelines, or EIAG. Updates on the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2001, or AMLA as amended, the Philippines Anti-Money Laundering Counter-Terrorism Financing Technical and Effectiveness Compliance, and the targeted financial sanctions related to the proliferation of financing of weapons of mass destruction. Unlike most financial intelligence units, FIU or FIUs of other countries, the Philippines AMLC is a hybrid FIU. 
not only does the AMLC receive and analyze covered and transaction uh, reports and suspicious transactions. reports, but it also investigates money laundering and terrorism financing and causes the filing of forfeiture proceedings and money laundering and terrorism financing cases. As the threat of money laundering and terrorism financing are evolving, there is a need to adequately manage and monitor the level and direction of this risk in coordination with various stakeholders to further strengthen this hybrid type of organizational structure. The AMLC then underwent a two-phase reorganization in 2017 and 2018. We expanded the financial intelligence analysis functions and constituting units to address specific areas as mirrored in the Financial Action Task Force or PAPF recommendations, such as the Investigation and Enforcement Department, the Detection Prevention Department, which includes the Compliance and Supervision Group. Compliance and Supervision Group of the AMLC. The AMLC's Compliance and Supervision Group, or CSG, ensures the compliance of covered persons with AML, CTF laws, regulations, and other issuances by conducting regular on-site examinations of covered persons not under the supervision of other supervisory authorities, targeted on-site examinations of, of covered persons with possible compliance violations, and on-site supervision of covered persons. The role of supervision in AML-CTF framework is to supervise and monitor covered persons to ensure that their money laundering and terrorism financing risks are managed and that AML-CTF preventive measures are compliant with laws and regulations. Five stages of risk-based supervisory framework. To effectively discharge its functions as AML CTF supervisor, the AMLC has adopted five stages of risk based supervisory framework. Namely, number one, to capture covered persons, number two, information dissemination and environmental scanning, three, risk assessment, four, risk based supervision and compliance checking of covered persons and five, enforcement action and filing of cases. Stage one is the capture of covered person. Let's look at this first stage, the capture of covered persons. Previously, only the following designated financial, non-financial businesses and professions or DNFBPs were covered persons under the AMLA. Jewelry dealers and precious metals, jewelry dealers and precious stones, company service providers, which as a business provide the following services to third parties, acting as formation agent, acting or arranging for another person to act as director or corporate secretary of a company, providing registered office, business address or accommodation, acting or arranging for another person to act as a nominee or shareholder for another person, and also persons who provide any of the following services managing of client money, securities, and other assets, management of bank savings and security accounts, organization of contributions for creation, operation, and management, creation of op operation or management of juridical persons. Through Republic Act or RA-11521 and RA-10365, the AMLA was amended to expand its coverage among the real estate sector and other DNFPPs. RA11521 indicate, includes covered persons such as real estate developers and brokers, offshore gaming operators or OGOS, OGO service providers or OGO SPs, 
that are supervised, accredited, and regulated by the Philippine Amusement Gaming Corporation or PAGCOR, or other appropriate government agencies. Subsequently, the AMLC amended certain provisions of the 2018 IRR or Implementing Rules and Regulations of AMLA and issued the 2021 AMLCTF guidelines for DNFBPs. Under the amended DNFBP guidelines, new covered persons and existing DNFBPs who have yet to register with AMLC are required to register with the AMLC within six months from the effectivity of the guidelines that is December 21, 2021. In, case, in the case of newly established DNFBPs, registration must be done prior to commencement of its operation as DNFBPs. The AMLC also issued the 2021 AMLC Registration and Reporting Guidelines, or ARRG, that provide a more comprehensive and legal policy framework for the registration of persons with the AMLC. While we are on the subject of amendments, we will briefly look into the recent AMLA amendments. The AMLA has undergone five amendments since the law passed in 2001. As mentioned, a notable amendment to RA 11521 is the inclusion of two new types of covered persons, as I mentioned, real estate brokers and developers, offshore gaming operators, as well as their service providers. Further, two new predicate offenses were created. One is the violation of Section 19A3 of Republic Act 10697, otherwise as the otherwise known as the Strategic Trade Management Act or STMA in relation to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and its financing pursuant to the UN United Nations Security Council Resolutions Number 1718. And uh, United Council, uh, United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231 of 2015. And also, an, an, another predicate offense is the violation of Section 254, Chapter 3, Chapter 2, Title 10 of the NIRC or National Internal Revenue Code of 1997, where the deficiency of basic tax due in the final assessment is in excess of 25 million pesos per taxable year for each tax type covered and there has been a finding of probable cause by the competent authority such as the BIR. For sharing of information, uh, dissemination and environmental scanning, this is the second stage. The AMLC has always implemented AMLCTF awareness campaigns for covered persons through its regular webinars, the AMLC has reached hundreds of covered persons despite restrictions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and has provided an understanding of money laundering and terrorism financing risk among covered persons. The AMLC's webinars examine the fundamentals of money laundering and an overview of the risk management system and preventive measures while fostering cooperation and open communication. Outreach activities and trainings have also been opportunities for environmental scanning, which allows various sectors to assess if they are covered persons and thus register with AMLC. Further conducting baseline offsite compliance examinations enables the AMLC to educate covered persons on their obligations under the AMLA as amended through discussion of deficiencies uncovered during examination. The next is the third stage, which is risk assessment. The AMLC employs risk-based approach to supervisions, which involves tailoring the supervisory response to fit the assessed risk. This approach allows supervisors to allocate finite resources to effectively mitigate money laundering and terrorism financing risks that have been identified and that are aligned with national priorities. This reduces the opportunity for criminals to launder their illicit proceeds and for terrorists to finance their operations. 
The quality of information available to law enforcement authorities is thus improved, and the supervisory activities avoid placing unwarranted burden on lower risk sectors, entities, and activities. To support its risk-based approach, the AMLC conducts various risk assessments, among of which are the following. The NRA, or National Risk Assessment, is a government-wide activity undertaking to develop risk-based AMLCTF actions to facilitate the allocation of available resources to control, mitigate, and eliminate risk. The AMLC has undertaken two NRAs in 2016 and 2017. Based on the second NRA, the national money laundering threat is high, the national money laundering vulnerability is medium, and the overall terrorism and terrorism financing threat is high. Second, the, NF, the NFBP sectoral risk assessment. Environmental scanning and risk and vulnerability assessment were conducted on the DNFBP sector, especially on jewel, jewelry dealers and dealers in precious metals and precious stones. Also, company service providers, accountants, lawyers, and OGO service providers through a DNFBP risk assessment and data collection questionnaire. The questionnaire aims to assess the current money laundering and terrorism financing threats facing that sector. Level of awareness of covered persons of the threats faced by their institution and industry, and the existence of the AML CTF controls of each entity. The questionnaire also serves as an off site monitoring, supervisory, and risk profiling tool for the AMLC's compliance and supervision group to be used in the prioritization of future compliance checking activities based on the responses. Entities with low level of AML CTF awareness and compliance are vulnerable to the threat of ML and TF, thus need close supervision and will be considered as priority entities subject to compliance checking. The fourth stage of risk-based supervisory framework is risk-based supervision and compliance checking of covered persons. As mentioned, the AMLC conducts on-site and off-site compliance examination of covered persons to be able to continuously perform its mandate amid community quarantines. The AMLC has adopted an off-site compliance strategy. Entities that refuse to cooperate with the AMLC can be subject to enforcement actions in accordance with the uh, EAG or enforcement action guidelines, which includes releasing a public advisory on the covered person, among others. As part of due process, however, this entity shall be informed of their findings, of the findings, as well as enforcement actions imposed through a notice of non-compliance pursuant to the enforcement action guidelines. The fifth stage is the enforcement action and filing of cases. If flaws in risk management practices or breaches of laws or regulations are identified, AMLCTF supervisors will apply a proportionate range of remedial actions to address the identified deficiency, including the appropriate sanctions that may include financial penalties for more severe violations of AMLCTF legal or regulatory requirements. Consistence with AMLC uh, supervisory framework, a range of available proportionate and dissuasive enforcement actions have been adopted and implemented. The AMLC issued the Enforcement Action Guidelines, or EAG, that supplement the Rules of Procedure in Administrative Cases, or ARPA, by providing a procedure for early resolution of administrative cases at the level of the AMLC's Compliance and Supervision Group prior to the filing of a formal charge under DARPA. The Rules of Procedure in Administrative Cases, or ARPA, and the Rules and Guidelines and other issuances of the Anti-Money Laundering Council and the imposition of administrative sanctions under DARPA 
supersede the rules on imposition of administrative sanctions under the RIAS, which is the old rules applying to administrative cases. What are the salient features of the RPAC? The salient features include the following. The RPAC first is intended to apply to administrative cases for non-compliance or violations of the AMLA as amended in its implementing rules and guidelines. The RPAC also covers not only administrative cases against covered persons, but also against officers, directors, and employees of covered persons. Monetary sanctions under the RPAC are based on covered persons, first, asset size, and second, the gravity of the violation or non-compliance based on a graduated scale of proportion or amount involved. For light violations, for example, of non-compliance with transaction reporting requirements, there will be a, a minimum penalty that may be assessed 1,500 pesos for non-compliance of covered transaction reporting requirements for covered persons with small asset size or a per account basis. For another feature of the RPAC is unlike the former rule, the former rules or the RIAS, the RPAC identifies the type of covered person subject of administrative cases. The EIAG or Enforcement Action Guidelines, on the other hand, uh, in contrast to the RPAC, describes AMLC's approach to ensure strict compliance with the AML CTF laws and rules and regulations and impose proportionate and dissuasive sanctions for non-compliance. To exhaust, whenever appropriate, enforcement actions to allow the AMLC and the covered persons to save resources and let the covered person, the covered person's board of directors and senior management to take a timely, act timely actions to correct violations and deficiencies. These EIA guidelines cover compliance and supervision groups assessment procedures and enforcement actions for the AML CTF non-compliance issues of covered persons, including but not limited to the following. Absence or inadequate oversight by the board of directors and senior management, absence or deficiencies in AML uh, terrorism financing program, absence or inadequate internal audit and control, violations of risk profiling and customer due diligence, non-submission or delayed submission of KYC documents, deficiencies of customer accounts transaction. To continue, the EAG uh, scope of non-compliance also includes non-filing, late filing of CTRs, STRs, submission or delayed submissions of uh, CTRs, STRs uh, pursuant to the AMLA, failure to comply with record keeping uh, requirements, absence or inadequate education and training programs, violations of court orders of the Court of Appeals, of the RTC regarding freeze orders, a bank inquiry or civil for future orders or decisions. And also uh, the non-compliances include also violations of APOS, APOS, among other uh, decisions of the civil for future in the civil for future proceedings. And also delay in the implementation of bank inquiry orders and also the PAPOS and APOS. Failure to register with the AMLC, among other violations. The CSG or the Compliance Supervision Group of the AMLC may take action on any of the non-compliance issue upon information from any of the following sources of information. These are our sources of information briefly and just to show, give you some of the uh, sources of our information for non-compliance issues. Sometimes they can be, compliance issues can be discovered during on-site or off-site examination or checking or testing by, with the, of, of the covered persons by the AMLC. We also um, monitor or find compliance issues during investigation and intelligence reports or referrals from different units of the AMLC. We also look at the complaints from industry stakeholders, law enforcement agency, and whistleblowers. 
We also um, find compliance issues whenever there's a voluntary disclosure from uh, the covered persons themselves and also from the examination, reports of examination and compliance checking reports of other supervisory authorities and also the AMLC, major reports, uh, reports and, and complaints from the general public and other reliable sources of information. Inform enforcement actions are measures that are used when circumstances surrounding non-compliance warrant a less severe form of supervisory action. And the covered persons exhibit willingness to voluntarily address compliance issues within a reasonable period of time and without the necessity of filing a formal charge under the ARPA. Moreover, enforcement actions are informal in nature. They are confidential and are neither published nor publicly available. The AMLC may impose any of the, or all of the following enforcement actions as warranted. One is warning, which involves a letter addressed to the president or chief executive or operating officer of the covered person. Another is a compliance letter which generally used to correct minus vi minor violations or to request periodic reports addressing certain aspects or certain issues of the covered persons. Notarized compliance commitment, which is an informant enforcement action of moderate severity. It generally represents a number of notarized commitments made by the covered persons, board of directors, or its equivalents, and incorporated into the covered persons minutes of the meeting as certified by the corporate secretary or its equivalent. We have also the look back, where at, on a case to case basis, the covered person conducts a thorough review of all business transactions covering a certain period, not to exceed five years. Another is compliance testing, which requires a covered person's covered persons to conduct compliance testing of its systems, processes, and procedures to check their effectiveness and efficiency. Colliorality to such requirement, the covered person must furnish the MLC with a detailed report under oath on the results of such compliance testing. Another uh, uh, a uh, measure that we impose is audit by an independent external auditor, where the covered person is required to engage in services of external auditor, who or which will conduct an independent audit of the systems, processes, and procedures to determine the extent uh, and severity of issues within the covered persons. Another is restitution of funds of the property where the event of the freeze order of orders of the court issued by the court or by the RTC may be ordered to be reimbursed or funds withdrawn or dissipated by reason of the violation of such order of the Court of Appeals or the RTC. Another is public advisory. This involves the issuance by the AMLC of an advisory in its official website in relation to non-compliance by a covered person with the provisions of the AML, uh, AMLA as amended and the TFPSA and their respective implementing rules and regulations. And this includes, for example, non-registration by the covered person with the AMLC, operating or performing the functions of a covered person under the AMLA without the necessary license from any relevant supervising authority and the like. The guidelines also provide the option for the covered person to choose a reduced assessment, thereby the covered person will be required only to pay an assessment lower than what would otherwise be computed the, under the rules on administrative cases or ARPA, if a case or a formal charge 
is filed against a covered person. A covered person may opt to settle for a reduced assessment during the assessment process and pay only 25% of the supposed penalty under Section 2, Rule 4. The guidelines also encourage voluntary disclosures by covered persons of possible violations to ascertain the root cause of the issues involved and resolve them at the earliest possible time. A covered person which voluntarily discloses possible violations may be given only a warning or reprimand or may be eligible for an exemption for monetary penalty or significantly reduced amount deduction in the assessment of up to 90% discount or the supposed penalty under Section 2, Rule 4 of the ARPA, provided that the covered person took steps to immediately correct the possible violation and has shown the root cause has been effectively addressed. Other factors that may be considered in determining the appropriate reduction rate are Number one, corrective measures, measures made by the covered persons. Number two, active cooperation by the covered person with AMLC during the assessment process. The covered person has exerted efforts in good faith to comply with the pertinent law or rules and regulations that it failed, may otherwise fail to comply with uh, due to circumstances beyond its control. Another is uh, timeliness and adequacy of corrective measures taken. Another factor is the history of instituting timely remedial measures or corrective measures and establishing procedures to prevent future deficiencies or violations. And another factor is the AML risk rating of the covered person. The covered person may choose to settle for a reduced assessment at any time during the enforcement action, but prior to the approval of the report, report of compliance or ROC by submitting a request in writing, signifying its intention to avail the reduced assessment. The AMLC's Compliance Supervision Group, or CSG, will then evalu evaluate the request of the covered person and if found acceptable, will incorporate the reduced assessment in the preparation of the report of compliance. To qualify for a reduced assessment, a covered person must comply with all of the following conditions. We have um, a minimum of three conditions uh, shown here. One is to commit within a reasonable period of time to take appropriate action in order to address the alleged violation or compliance issues. Another is to take measures to ensure the violations do not persist from the day it avails of the reduced assessment. And of course, there should be an under undertaking that it will refrain from engaging again in acts that led to such violation or compliance issue. And the cover person will have to confirm payment of the assessment and take the necessary steps to comply with the relevant regulatory requirements and to remedy the consequences of such contravention, if necessary. Now we go to the topic of the mutual evaluation of the Philippines or the inclusion of the Philippines in the gray list of the FATF. Uh, there are certain amendments in the anti money laundering act where among were among and these are the necessary actions that would address our country's AML CTF deficiencies. Just for the information of uh, all participants or, or everybody, in 2018, the Philippines underwent its uh, third mutual evaluation where the country was assessed of its levels of technical compliance with international AL, AML CTF standards. And also we were assessed of our effectiveness compliance of our existing AML CTF mechanisms. It will be recalled that the country's first and second and ease or mutual evaluation only involved the technical compliance aspect. 
The technical assessment considers the specific requirements of the PAT F40 recommendations relative to the existence of legal and institutional framework of the country and the powers and procedures of the competent authorities. In other words, the technical compliance assessment checks whether the country's existing laws, rules, and regulations, and assurances comply with the FAT F standards and its criteria. This is the technical assessment area. With the passage of the of RA11479 or the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 or ATA, the passage of RA11521 that further amended the Anti-Money Laundering Act and the issuance of the necessary implementing rules and regulation of both laws, the Philippines was able to address the technical deficiencies required or expected by the uh, FATF. Adapting compliant laws and regulations, however, and let me emphasize this, is not sufficient. As I mentioned, there is a area that the effectiveness assessment area. The effectiveness assessment seeks to evaluate the adequacy of the implementation of these laws, which I mentioned, and rules and regulations vis-a-vis -vis the FAT F40 recommendations. There are 11 immediate outcomes or IO. These are key goals that, that, an, F, that an effective AML CTF framework should achieve. Each country must enforce these measures and ensure the operational law enforcement and legal components of the AML CTF system work together effectively to achieve a passing rate of at least substantial for each of the 11 immediate outcomes or items. It must be noted that this AML CTF system includes not only AMLC, but includes law enforcement, security, intelligence, prosecutorial, supervisory, regulatory, and other government agencies. It also includes the private sector, including the private the covered persons. Simply put, the focus of the effectiveness assessment is on the extent to which the legal and institutional framework is producing the expected results over a sustained period of time. Thus, the Philippines has been identified a, as a jurisdiction under its increased monitoring or has been included in the gray list generally because the country would need more time to implement this relatively recent AML CTF laws, rules and regulations, and issuances to demonstrate their effectiveness. Particularly, the Philippines must address the ICRG Action Plan or the International Cooperation Review Group Action Plan, which concerns various government agencies and law enforcement agencies within the timelines provided by the FATF. These action items pertain to various IOs or immediate outcomes to assess if our country is effectively implementing AML-CTF laws and regulations. Is this the first time the Philippines was placed in the gray list? No. In 2000, prior to RA9160 or the AMLA law as amended, the Philippines lacked the basic legal AML framework. The country was then placed under the FAT F list of non-cooperative countries and, and territories or NCCT, otherwise known as the blacklist. Even with the enactment of the AMLA in September 2001, 20, 20, the Philippines remained on the NCCT list as there were still deficiencies in the law. In March 2003, RA 9194 was signed into law, amending the AMLA again. However, after the Asset Pacific Group on Money Laundering or APG Review Group confirmed that the Philippines was effectively implementing the AML measures the Philippines was removed from the NCCT list in February 2005. In 2008, the Philippines underwent a second mutual evaluation conducted jointly by the World Bank and the APG. 
due to technical deficiencies, such as the lack of CTF laws and other regulations, the Philippines was uh, placed in the gray list in February of 2010 until December 2011 to address these identified deficiencies. The Philippines, however, failed to meet the deadline. Thus, in February 20, 2012, the Philippines was downgraded to dark gray list. With the passage of RA 10167 and the TFPSA or Terrorism Financing and Suppression Act 2012, the Philippines returned to the gray list and was urged to fully address its remaining deficiencies. In February 2013, RA 10365 further amended the act, was signed into law. The country exited the gray list in June 2013, but remained on the watch list. It was only in July 2017 when the Philippines was removed from the watch list with the passage of RA 10927, or known as the Casino Law. And now our country is back in the gray list again, generally because the Philippines would need more time to implement the new AML CTF laws, the regulations, and other relevant issuances to demonstrate their effectiveness. Gray listed jurisdictions such as the Philippines must swiftly resolve all identified deficiencies within a time frame and must report its progress, the FAT F. Frequently, thus the term increased monitoring. As mentioned, the Philippines must address the ICRG action plan within the timelines provided by the FATF. The ICRG action plan broadly covers the following. Supervision of covered persons, access to beneficial ownership information, enhancement of money laundering and terrorism financing investigations, prosecutions, and confiscations. Enforcement of cross-border declarations, use of targeted financial sanctions in terrorism, terrorism financing, and proliferation financing of weapons of mass destruction, risk-based measures to protect nonprofit organizations. It is worth mentioning that the ICRG Action Plan does not require any legislative action from the Philippines anymore. This means that the country's laws are generally compliant with the requirements of the FATF. The ICRG action plans focus on how the country is effectively implementing its AML, CTF laws and regulations. Further, the mere inclusion of the Philippines in the gray list does not automatically mean the imposition, imposition of countermeasures including the application of enhanced due diligence measures on the subjects of the Philippines. These countermeasures would treat all Filipinos and their businesses as high risk, money laundering, and terrorism financing, and would lead to additional costs and delays in transactions. For overseas workers, it would mean higher remittance costs, thus, less money for daily food and necessitates their families uh, in the Philippines and necessitate less money for daily food and necessities for their families in the Philippines. For Philippine businesses, it would mean higher interest rates and thus higher production costs. Moreover, higher production, higher costs and additional layers of customer due diligence may lead to the risking of Filipino individuals and businesses that is rejecting business relations with all Filipinos. If the Philippines fails to meet the deadlines in, the, in accomplishing the action plan items, then the FATF may consider calling on all countries or con on countries to impose countermeasures against the Philippines. But it must again be emphasized and understood that accomplishing the action plan within the time frame provides, provided requires a whole-of-nation approach. 
agencies responsible for the implementation of the action plan are the following. On risk-based supervision of covered persons are the supervisors, PADCOR, the Guyan Economic Zone Authority, Authority, Aurora uh, Pacific Economic Zone and Freeport Authority, the BSP, SEC, and the Insurance Commission. On money laundering and terrorism financing investigation are the law enforcement agencies, the PNP, the National Bureau of Investigation, PIDEA, the Intelligence Service of the Armed Forces, and the NICA, the Philippine Center of Transnational Crime, among other law enforcement agencies and security intelligence agencies. The money laundering and terrorism financing prosecution, the Department of Justice, the Ombudsman, and also the AMS. Again, we'd like to emphasize that while we are in the gray list, there are no countermeasures yet being imposed on the Philippines. In the case of covered persons, they must continuously and effectively implement their core AMLCTF obligations, such as CDD, record keeping, and filing of CPR and SCRs. Covered persons, such as financial institutions and DNFDPs, should continuously demonstrate an understanding of money laundering and terrorism financing risk in their sector and implement the necessary preventive measures to mitigate those risks. In particular, the FATF has placed focus on covered persons implement implementations of targeted financial sanctions or, or TFS obligations, both for terrorism financing and proliferation financing of weapons mass destruction. Covered persons must understand their TFS obligations. So what are the targeted financial sanctions or TFS? Targeted financial sanctions refer, refers to both asset freezing and prohibition to prevent funds or other assets from being made available directly or indirectly for the benefit of any individual, natural or legal, or any entity designated pursuant to the relevant United Nations Security Council resolution or UNSCRs and its designation process. The international community can use these sanctions to charge the behavior of any country or regime in cases where that country or regime is violating human rights, waging war, or endangering international peace and security, such as the actions of the Al-Qaeda, Taliban, ISIL, as well as nuclear programs of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and Iran. The objective of these actions were whether imposed by the UN or domestically designated or implemented by the AMLC is to prevent those designated from accessing funds as well as accessing financial services. The legal basis for targeted financial sanctions as are follows. Section 7, uh, uh, number five of the anti money laundering act as amended or RA11521, which took effect in January of 2021, where uh, it covers targeted financial sanctions in relation to proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and its financing, including party freeze, which must be implemented without delay against all funds and assets uh, of those who owns and controls the these funds and assets and these funds and assets are derived or generated from individuals or entities who are designated. Another legal basis is section 36 of RA 1147 or the ATA and section 11 of the TFPSA, which provides that the Philippine, uh, which provides that consistent with the Philippines international obligations, the AMLC is authorized to issue a freeze order with respect to property or funds uh, of owned or controlled by designated organization, association, group, or any individual uh, in compliance with the binding terrorism-related resolutions of the United Nations Security Council. 
In this regard, in addition to the issuance of the TFS related to the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and its financing, as I mentioned a while ago, the AMLC issued a guidance for the listing and unfreezing procedures related to proliferation financing. And this is one of the action items under our ICRG process. The basic obligation of covered person is to freeze without delay whenever there is a name match or a potential match and also to inform the MLC of such freezing. Basically, these are the basic obligations. One is to freeze without delay, which is just an implementation of the sanctions freeze, and also informing the MLC of such freezing. The MLC should respond within 36 hours, otherwise public persons may lift the order. CDD is critical part of uh, TFS obligations, and COVID persons must have policies and processes in place to determine if customers or potential customers are included in the various sanction list. COVID persons must also have a screening process and must scrub their database every time there, is, there are updates in the sanction list. Covered person must also know when to file STR, when to validate to the AMLC, and when to freeze. It is expected that covered persons freeze without delay whenever the AMLC issues a sanction freeze or freeze order for any positive matches and file returns with the AMLC. In the AMLC advisories, covered persons are mandated, again, as I mentioned, please without delay, to file SCRs regarding previous transactions on the account and not to deal with the designated organizations and individual less. If they deal with a designated person or individual, they, the covered person, may be subject, may be found to be to have violated Section A of RA 10168 and Section 12 of the ATA. The full text of these AMLC advisories can be viewed in the links provided in this slide. To summarize, whenever, whenever the AMLC issues a sanctions freeze order, these steps must be uh, followed. First, scrub this customer database. Second, if there is a name match, there must be a freeze without delay. Third, covered person must contact the AMLC through email or call. Then it's the turn of AMLC to respond within 36 hours. If the, if the AMLC fails to respond, the freeze order should be lifted. Number six, the AMLC response within the said period. Covered person must carefully read the response, either lifting the freeze order or retaining the freeze. In the Philippines, who are considered as designated persons? One is any person or entity designated as a terrorist or one who finances terrorism or one who finances terrorist organization or group under the applicable United Nations Security Council resolution or um, by another jurisdiction or supranational jurisdiction. Also, any person, organization, association, or group of persons who are designated under Paragraph 3, Section 25 of the ATA and also any person or entity designated under UNSCR 1718, and uh, those concerning the Democratic People's Republic of Korea under uh, UNSCR 2231 concerning Islamic Republic of Iran.
Under the second classification, which is the paragraph 3, section 5 of the ATA, I believe this is a domestic designation by the ATC. It must be understood, however, that these sanctions are more than list-based screening. Those listed by the UN should have their assets frozen, but actions must also cover those first acting on behalf or at the direction of designated persons or entity, those who own or controlled by them, those assisting them in evading sanctions or violating resolution provisions. Remember that proliferators and those designated know, definitely know, if their names are on a sanctions list. Now, once designated, how can individuals or entities request the listing? A petitioner may submit, or the one designated may submit a request for the listing to the focal point, focal point for the listing through their state or residence or nationality in cases involving designated persons or organizations under the relevant United Nations Security Council resolution list, designation list. Also, the designee may also file uh, a petition for the listing, may also file with the Court of Appeals. If the frozen assets or funds uh, were frozen by mistake, as provided for the under the ATA, any person who was wrongfully sanctioned by the asset freezing for having a similar name as the designated uh, individual or group, he or she may apply for the lifting of the freeze by submitting with the AMLC relevant identification documents such as national ID, passport, birth certificate, certificate of registration issued by any appropriate government agency and the like. These are just some of the remedies of those listed as designated individuals or organizations. There are two types of exemptions to asset freeze, and they are classified into two basic expenses or extraordinary expenses. For basic expenses, uh, this may include payment for food, rent, mortgage, medicine, medical treatment, taxes, premiums, among others, and public utilities. Payment for reasonable professional fees, reimbursement, or for expenses associated with legal services. Other uh, basic expenses include also fees or services, uh, charges for services for routine holding of routine holding or maintenance of frozen funds or other financial assets or economic resources. Extraordinary expenses are categories other than the ones mentioned in paragraph A of uh, United Nations Resolution 1452. Designated persons or entities may also apply to the AMLC. An authorization to make payments due under a contract entered into prior to the listing of such person or entity. Yes, this, this will be also one of the remedies of the designated person or entity that that person may directly apply with the MLC for authorization to make payments. For further guidance, you may, may download uh, designated uh, cover persons may, may download the 2021 sanction guidelines, guidance for the listing and, util and freezing procedures, and the uh, 2021 MLC registration and reporting guidelines. So to sum up today's lecture, 
First, covered persons must not, must not only have the AML CTF issuances embedded in their respective rules and regulations, but they must also ensure proper implementation for these issuances to be effective. Just as the Philippines is committed in investing resources to demonstrate effective implementation of AML CTF laws and regulations for our future generation, the private sector should likewise invest in ensuring the culture of compliance is deeply embedded in its operations. Second, the AMLC enforcement is noble, rational, and transparent. As the enforcement action mechanism is properly in place and widely disseminated, it is the objective of AMLC to utilize its supervisory authority to instill discipline among covered persons. If possible, covered persons are encouraged to avail of reduced assessment and redirect, redirect company assets towards the improvement of AML CTF systems. More often, the cost of compliance is cheaper than the cost of non-compliance. And third, the country's exit the gray list requires commitment and cooperation among the public and private sectors in addressing the ICRG action plan. The country must demonstrate its AML CTF system in delivering expected results, and the failure to do so will have repercussions in the economy. More important, we must grasp that this, not just about mere compliance, but about fundamentally strengthening our AML CTF systems that would prove beneficial to most, if not all, even beyond our lifetime. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Attorney Matthew, uh, for that uh, presentation. As mentioned by Ms. Edith earlier, uh, Attorney Matthew will not join us in the panel but he will be ably represented by two of his colleagues, uh, Attorney Kimi Ross, Lino Lott, and the Deputy Director of the AMLC, Attorney Arnold Cabalit. But at this point, allow me to introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker uh, is our go-to person uh, in Phoenix. Um, she, um, she's a partner within the SGV's financial services. She's currently focused on the financial crime practice, especially on AML CTPF. She's a certified anti-money laundering specialist and a certified public accountant. Lisa is also an accredited trainer of the Anti-Money Laundering Council known as AMLC. And she is also one of the founders and the previous co-chair of the Philippine chapter of the Association of Certified Anti-Money -Money Laundering Specialists. Please welcome our second speaker, Ms. Nika Palisi. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald, for your kind introductions and good afternoon to the officers and members of Phoenix and, of course, to all attendees supporting the Phoenix event today. It is really an honor to be here. I know this is not your first AML session, and as officers of covered institutions or a covered person yourself, you have probably attended several AML seminars already. So I'm not here to discuss fundamentals. I think Attorney Matthew also um, touched on uh, certain hot topics in AML. And I won't also discuss regulatory updates and developments. What I was requested to discuss today is some key takeaways for our audience. I understand our audience are mainly composed of probably senior management. Now, but before we get into that, as I've said, you are not new to AMLA. AMLA, the law has been there since 2001. 
Attorney Matthew gave a good um, background of our journey since then. And the covered financial institutions have been covered by AMLA even since 2001. If there are officers for newly covered um, industries like casinos and real estate, of course, this is new to you. But why is it one of the top agenda today? Why is it one of the top agenda of senior management and directors, even for those previously covered? Philippines remains to be a high-risk country and remains to be in the gray list. You heard Attorney Matthew asking for our help. Regulators are increasing the use of enforcement actions and the impact is real and the cost is high. Now, as a country, we know that the traction on local AML CTPF regulatory landscape was really augmented when? It was in 2016, if you remember the Bangladesh heist. But it continued on. It's already 2022. Because globally, predicate crimes thrive. And unfortunately, Philippines is considered a high-risk country. What does that mean in terms of AML, CTPF? A high-risk country means that there are a lot of money from crimes in Manila. So even if you were not in the industry with high risk threat, um, like the banks, they are considered um, high threat uh, risk rating. But given inherently you are operating in this country, all covered institutions face high inherent risks, especially as banks have strengthened their compliance and processes and controls. Criminals are looking elsewhere for a weak spot. Now, it has been more than a year since June 2021. Remember that time? That was when Philippines has been included in what we call FATF's list of jurisdictions under increased monitoring. So what is that? That is more popularly known as the gray list. Now, what is the effect of being in the gray list? And I echo Attorney Matthew's points. Now, the extent and the extent and timing on... Um, the trade and investments, it's still uncertain. No? But there will be um, an impact. There are expected impact given now that we are high risk, no? given that we are considered high risk by our counterparties. So what does that mean? Our counterparties abroad, no? depending on their policies, they may their risk, meaning they won't deal with us, or they will price higher. Or it, they will make it difficult for us because now we need to go and undergo enhanced due diligence as their customers or counterparties. Now, this slide shows credit risk ratings of countries that are currently in the gray and black list. What do you think? Do we really belong to that list? Do we want to be? part of this list. Just to share with you, if you look at the details closely, except for Panama, you can see that countries in the list before we were put in um, the gray list or this list, they either do not have credit rating, which is not good, or they have low credit rating or below investment grade. Even Panama, while its current credit risk rating is still investment grade, did you know that it was downgraded from triple B after about just a year being in the gray list. Now, being in the gray list may not necessarily be the main driver, but surely it may have been a significant contributor, don't you think? Now, we will have to wait and see whether being in the gray list will have an impact on our credit rating, or hopefully we are able to get out of the list before it will. Now, the next slide. I know Attorney Matthew also touched on this um, earlier. This is a summary of the third mutual evaluation report on the Philippines compared to select countries. Now, the upper part shows technical compliance to what we call the FATF 40 recommendations. We consider that the global standards and aim. Now, technical compliance means whether we have enacted laws and regulations. Now, if you look at the, the slide, with the exception of USA, most of the countries do not have compliance. 
not I mean non-compliance. Philippines has one that is related to the proliferation financing or the sanctions that Attorney Matthew shared with you earlier. Because before the amendment of the AMLA in early 2021, sanctions guidelines are not yet clarified in the law. We have sanctions guidelines, but not yet um, really embedded in AMLA. But AMLA has been amended last 2021, thus being included there. And you would agree that sanctions policies may not be really effectively implemented yet in the Philippine covered companies before last year. Just to also share with you the several areas that were rated as partially compliant and some interesting discussions. You must have seen that in the news. There were discussions, a lot, there were a lot of discussions about terrorist financing. Terrorist financing threat in Manila is high. You know that? Do you believe that? Yes, terrorist financing threat in Manila is high. But do you know that there are very low suspicious transactions reported and no terrorist financing prosecutions done yet in the Philippines at the time of the review? There were also discussions about supervision on casino and real estate brokers. Remember, these two industries were only recently covered by AMLA. Actually, the Philippines enacted the law covering casinos right after the Bangladesh heist, before the mutual evaluation reviewers came. But of course, the reviewers still pointed out lack of implementation and supervision and considered it partially compliant. Now, there are a lot of other things you must have read in the news. The absence of tax evasion in the list of predicate crimes, the bank secrecy law, lack of national ID, and most especially the information on beneficial ownership. Now, moreover, and more importantly, if you look at the second table below, the overall level of effectiveness is based on what we call the 11 immediate outcomes. Attorney Matthew already shared what those are. But I'd like you to look at and compare it to other select countries. So the results are glaring and it's showing that majority for the Philippines are low effectiveness. So while we may have laws and regulations, the implementation of these are seen to be low effectiveness, low if are not effective. So what does that mean? We have laws and regulations, but most probably criminal monies are really circulating in our covered sectors. Threats may not be detected. And most especially, criminals are not disrupted or sanctioned. Surely, we would expect that there will be much more regulatory focus, and we have our AMLC friends here, as regulators will exhibit effective implementation. I remember um, just after the Bangladesh heist, our regulators have been very diligent in sending out warning letters. There were things about quality of STRs. There were notice of charge relating to non-submission of late CTRs. I'm sure if you're part of the industry, um, you would have known that. You also may have seen or heard regulators being very diligent in conducting examinations recently. Right, Attorney Arnold and Attorney Kimi, including thematic reviews. But you know, this is across the group across the globe as part of the regulators' examinations. So, regulators are looking into directors' oversight or senior management's oversight. Now, to satisfy the regulators, boards of covered institutions need to do more than just set the tone at the top. Boards need to create a culture of compliance adequately resource compliance staff, and ensure they reach regulatory compliance and corporate governance goals. So an important skill for directors who maintain that oversight is knowing the right questions to ask. So that is the focus of our discussions later. I'm just given a total of 20 minutes. I will be throwing five questions to you as takeaways. And boards, hopefully, or in senior management, this will help you 
because you need enough expertise to provide a good counterbalance to the views of management. Last point, the last statement is self-explanatory. The impact is real and the cost is high. Now, some of my friends in, in the compliance departments would acknowledge that they are only seen as cost centers, right? I don't know if we have audience here that are compliance um, officers. No? And sometimes it may not be the top priority. No? Of course, business would be probably, which is wrong. And I think I echo again Attorney Matthew's message. Having no cases, having no sanctions from the regulators, these should also be considered as quantifiable benefits. Now, we have seen that it has been an existential problem for the bigger laundering cases abroad no, who were heavily fined, no, lost customers, no, and even counterparties they deal with reputational damage, the cost of rehabilitation. It's always much expensive to remediate and rehabilitate than doing it right on sale. Now, you, we are at the forefront of the country's defense strategy against financial crime. Hopefully, I was able to remind you why we should act now. All right, as promised, Basically, I would like to leave you with five questions or takeaways. How involved are you in your money laundering, terrorist, and proliferation financing risk assessments? Now, risk assessments have been a topic, a hot topic in the AML circle since probably 2018. And Attorney Matthew also discussed this earlier. Now, both FATF and the local regulators they are requiring us to do, actually pushing all covered institutions to conduct what we call an institutional risk assessment or IRA. The objective is really to determine the controls needed and identify heightened or emerging risks. This is actually not a new requirement, but similar to other standards, given there is a paradigm shift from a prescriptive approach in compliance to a risk-based approach, this warrants due attention by covered institutions. Now, my dear audience, just to reflect, how involved are you in your IRAs? Was it just an executive summary presented to you for your approval, discussed in less than an hour? Did you find it helpful? Did you understand the report that was given to you? Was it helpful for you to gain insights on the higher risk areas in your business? If you were not appropriately involved, one may wonder whether you are making the right decisions in your business absent a good understanding of the higher risk areas. I assume most of the audience here, since this is Phoenix, have a good background in finance. The higher the risk, the higher should be the price. Now, are money laundering and terrorist proliferation financing risks considered, say, in your pricing or business decisions to continue products and services or business relationships? Moreover, it should actually be helping you to maximize your risk-based approach to allocate your resources. The AMLA provides for a risk-based preventive measures and your IRA should be actually the tool for you to determine whether, where you will focus your limited resources. So you have to assess where the high-risk areas in your customers, location, products, and delivery channels. Next, are you still operating your KYC or know your client and customer due diligence or CDD separately from your transaction monitoring? Usually, when we say AML or AMLA, people would think of KYC or CDD, right? But by now, all of us here should know that it goes beyond that. However, what some of the covered persons might fail to recognize or do is to link the KYC and CDD with the transaction monitoring exercise. 
allow me to go through this diagram that we are sharing with you. Now, it starts really on your left side. That's basically your institutional risk assessment. That's your assessment of your company. Now, you will set, based on your risk appetite, set your processes and controls. Now, you conduct KYC and CDD based on your customer risk assessment. All information we got from your KYC and CDD activities should have and would be information we use for a transaction monitoring. What do you mean? That information should have helped you, aided you, to specifically determine the expected normal activity pattern of your customer. As such, that will help you what is suspicious because that is not within your normal activity pattern. Now, some questions to the audience. Is this how you are currently doing your transaction monitoring? Or are you just using some rules and thresholds across all your customers, across all your products and services? That's probably you're faced with voluminous false positives or worse, false negatives. Next, are you still seeing your anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist proliferation financing program as a matter for compliance only? Data is power. And data is the ammunition with which we fight financial crime more effectively with. KYC, CDD, PM. Imagine the volume of data required and that you keep or process to effectively implement your preventive measures on KYC, CDD, transaction monitoring, and even your IRA or institutional risk assessment. Imagine the volume of data. This actually can be used in other aspects of risk management or business like fraud and risk management. But more importantly, they can also be used by the business for customer insight, right? Now, your AML CTPF program should not be seen as just a compliance matter. Harness its benefits to have a better understanding of your customers to serve them better and recognizing that a good AML CTPF risk management framework creates a good brand and reputation of the company. Are you still using yesterday's technology to fight today's financial crime? Now. Money laundering and terrorist financing risks, they are dynamic. Criminals are tech-enabled. I remember attending a forum where they said that, you know, criminals are ahead of us of more than 10 years. And Philippines you know, is behind other countries for, let's say, another 10 years or 5 to 10 years. So imagine how, how enabled, tech-enabled criminals are. So we need to catch up. Automation and tech innovations, that's imperative in the future. So imagine the volume of data and sophisticated schemes that criminals are employing. Inevitably, through leveraging data, the, the technologies that are um, developing, data analytics models, I'm sure, I, I hope um, you belong to covered institutions who would have that in your financial crime compliance they would probably help improve the effectiveness of AML measures. But we need to be careful. Criminals set up multiple fake accounts via front organizations to enable them to launder the proceeds of their illegal activity, right? Anonymity is, of course, the criminal's best friend when it comes to exploiting the international financial system. Now, the rise in digital banking has, has actually um, made the situation a little bit worse because it enabled monies from criminals to be shifted around the world almost instantaneously. While banks invest billions in developing new systems, there are also a lot of less regulated financial technology platforms. 
Now, having systems in place that can better determine someone's true digital identity is therefore critical. So we really need to catch up. Financial institutions need to be confident that the customer really is who they say they are and creating a technology platform for the secure and traceable exchange of customer information. Lastly, the solution doesn't lie in fighting fire with fire. Instead, what is needed is a new way of working to combat these kinds of illegal activities. And if you look at the maturity ladder of a financial crime landscape, collaboration collaborative effort by both the public and private sector is a must. Many organizations are already actually taking advantage of new technologies to maximize resources, right? They work more smarter, and they fight financial crime with actually more efficient ways. But collaboration will be key to realizing the full potential of this innovation. To disrupt today's financial crimes, in other words, financial institutions and law enforcement agencies alike don't just need new technology, but we need to adopt a new way of working through collaboration. Lastly, are you the champion or the problem of compliance? Now, building a strong AML culture will enhance compliance. We all know that enhance compliance, reduce regulatory risk, and improve efficiency in AML. Now, in understanding the compliance framework, it is also important to know who is accountable. Unfortunately, in the Philippines, there is still confusion or wrong notion that this is the compliance officer's problem. That is where usually the problem lies, when the owners of the risk environment, who are actually the business units, do not really recognize its role or understand the role of the compliance officers. As senior management or those charged with mm -hmm. governance, do you know and understand your AML program? Are you supportive of it? Or will you be part of the problem? How are you, how are you being seen by, by, by your teams, by the compliance officer or by your employees? Remember, a lot of the scandals are not because of lack of AML controls. But there were a lot of times that it was just lack of governance. You may have all the processes, the systems, but if there is no tone from the top or the, the, the senior management and directors are seen you know, to be not supportive, then that would be the problem. So for to recap the five points, institutional risk assessments, Look into your transaction monitoring. Are, are you optimizing the transaction monitoring or do you need to tune them already? Customer insight data mm -hmm. coming from your KYC CDD. New way of working with technology through collaboration. And last but not the least, creating culture of compliance. Now, that was my last slide on takeaways, and I would like to close with a short message to the audience. In the conduct of your work, you might meet someone that may seem harmless, dressed and looks nice, someone you will not expect to be a criminal. You know? And as you get to know your client and conduct your due diligence, you may, may note some suspicious circumstances, but hey, you rationalize. Well, you may not be so sure, so I don't want to rock the boat, or you may think that reporting it is a waste of time, right? So you rationalize. You just look the other way. You are oblivious of the dangers and impact of what you may have done. There may be, they may be laundering money related to online sexual exploitation of children or OSEP. Do you know that in a forum I have attended during the pandemic, about online sexual exploitation of children, there were victims as young as 11 months. Yes, 11 months, babies. And as a new mother, that is really bothering me. During the pandemic, a lot of cases have been reported related to OSIC in the Philippines. Do you know that we are the number one supplier? Did you know that? 
they may be laundering money related to prostitution. They may be laundering money related to human trafficking. They may be laundering money related to drugs. And I do not need to describe the horrors brought by these drugs. Rape, murder, exploited children, depression, suicide. So the next time you look the other way, I think of the victims of the predicate crimes that your client may be doing or involved in. You play a vital role in money laundering war. Let us build a better Philippines. Being part of a highly regulated profession myself, let me share my mindset. There is no client worth it to put your firm or company at risk. There is no client worth it to put your profession at risk. There is no client worth it to let yourself be involved in money laundering. This, the next slide is my last slide. And we hope you can appreciate the fact that, you know, the tone that you set in your firms or companies has really a profound impact to the communities around you. And we should not allow money laundering or terrorist financing to penetrate our financial system. And by looking the other way, you actually allow criminals to thrive. Now, other than getting out of the gray list, I thought if we put a sense of purpose to the people implementing our AML policies or our covered institutions, no, we may just prove that this will be more effective. All right. So if you need help in your MTPP or your AML processes, want to discuss um, institutional risk assessments or anything that I have discussed with you, I know my team has flashed my QR code and I'd be happy to connect with you. Thanks, everyone. And I give the floor back to Ronald or Attorney Carla. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nika. Thank you very much. As mentioned earlier, uh, we, uh, we actually have panelists from the AMLC, Attorney Kimi Ross Lino Lot. She's actually a uh, Bank Officer for in the Compliance and Supervision Group of the Anti-Money Laundering Council. We also have uh, the Deputy Director of the AMLC, Attorney Arnold Cabandit, uh, to, uh, to act as moderator for our, for our panelists. Uh, we have Attorney Carla Denise Frias. Attorney Carla, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Ronald, and thank you to Phoenix for inviting me again in this session. Um, now, I'll, I'll get right through it. This is for either Arnold or Kimmy, because it was mentioned earlier that, you know, the Philippines is still on the gray list. And from what I heard with the presentations, it was a problem of implementation more than anything. As far as the rules are concerned, we all have those in place, et cetera, et cetera. Now, given this, do you think that the AMLC has sufficient power at present? to actually be able to effectively pursue its mandate? Or do you think that it is about time that you know, certain legislation be enacted to be able to give this agency more teeth in order for us to have you know, better implementation as stated in the recommendations uh, made by the FATF? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, to answer the question, um, the... Implementation of the AM, or AML and CFT uh, laws, rules, and regulations really entail a whole of government, a, a whole of nation approach. Um, right now, we are in the gray list because of the our effectiveness. As to the um, technical compliance, meaning we already have the laws, rules, and regulations, we are already compliant with around 37 out of the 40 FATF recommendations, which is actually more than... Uh, well, I guess a majority of the um, countries uh, in terms of their, their scoring as to the TC or technical compliance. But it's really the implementation where we have to, um, to catch up. We really have to um, coordinate with our law enforcement agencies to um, have more investigations, more prosecutions, convictions, uh, more um, for future cases, etc., as well as uh, improve our um, supervision over the DNFBTs or the designated non-financial business and, and professions. So right now, 
there is no um, specific uh, well requirement for us to amend a particular uh, portion of the AMLA just so that we can comply with the FAT F40 recommendations. It's really more on the uh, effectiveness or the implementations of the immediate outcomes as discussed uh, earlier by uh, Ms. Uh, Balifi. Yes. yes. Uh, thanks, Arnold, because um, I was reading about the recommendations of the FATF as well. And I understand that, you know, it's not just the AMLC who has to act with respect to, you know, whether or not the Philippines should be on the gray list. Um, One of the things that they also said was that we should increase our investigations and prosecutions. You mentioned earlier as well that, you know, it's it's basically problematic having to implement this. But what makes it so hard to implement? And I don't mean to rock the boat by blaming another agency or anything like that, but we do know that unlike crimes like murder, rape, which are, you know, which are sexy and which gives people like more interest, um, not everyone takes AML as seriously as they should. So what has been the main cause or causes of uh, the lack or the, per the perceived lack of investigations and prosecutions as far as AM, as far as money laundering is concerned? Well, um, it's it's caused by a variety of factors. No? Um, one is that uh, we still need um, more investigators, uh, more financial analysts on the part of the AMLC. Um, that's why we are all already coordinating with the law enforcement agencies, deputizing some of uh, their members so that they can also conduct their own money laundering investigation. However, they would still need to um, to coordinate with the AMLC because of the law on the secrecy of bank deposits no? and the restrictions uh, on the um, deposits and investments. They, they won't be able to go directly to the covered persons, to the financial institutions, particularly the banks. So they'll have to go to us and then we'll have to coordinate with uh, with them so that we can supply them with the information. And then they have to really show that they'll be able to investigate and then file the necessary um, cases. That would also require um, awareness no? uh, on the part of the our prosecutors, our, uh, on the part of our judges, uh, so that they will also be aware of the um, the requirements as well as the proceedings under the Anti-Money Laundering Act. Um, one thing also is that uh, because of our inclusion in the gray list, the AMLC also came out, say, for example, with the rules on criminal forfeiture. Uh, even before we already had the uh, provision on civil forfeiture in the Anti-Money Laundering Act, and we've been showing the um, the assessors that we've already been able to forfeit uh, a lot of um, properties, uh, a lot of funds, but they were looking at our criminal forfeiture so that we had to um, come out with the criminal, the rules on the criminal forfeiture. And then uh, we coordinated that with the Supreme Court and uh, right. thankfully the Supreme Court um, um, issued those rules. Uh, and then we are able to already have several cases already involving uh, loss of, uh, criminal for feature. And these have been feeding very positively into our efforts uh, to show the, um, the assessors that we are really serious in getting out of the gray list. Yeah, and what's uh, interesting about it is, of course, we know that the judges, the prosecutors, and you, Kimmy and Arnold, were all lawyers. And even as early as law school, there wasn't any super focus on AML yeah. even as a subject. So it's highly technical. And uh, my personal takeaway is that, you know, there has to be more exposure with respect to the judges who actually hear these cases, the prosecutors who actually go ahead and prosecute these cases, and even for the law enforcement agencies, because if they don't know what they're supposed to be looking at, then how are we going to have all these investigations and prosecutions? Now, as mentioned earlier, um, implementation requires participation of everyone, including the public, including the private sector. Now, Nika. This is one of the best panels I've been in because Nika and I have been friends since we were 10 years old and it's always a pleasure <laughs> to be talking with her. Now, Nika, um, transaction monitoring and IRAs are very important. What have been the challenges in you know, making sure that these are properly done so that the people, the audience, would be able to identify what is it that needs to be improved? Thanks. Thanks, Carla. And um, I I'm happy that uh, you caught the, the good key points um, yeah. in, in the discussion. The IRA, um, probably first and foremost, um, if that is seen to be a compliance matter, no, that would really not help you. 
I always say, for example, if there are clients who would like to engage us, on the onset, I will already say, um, I'm not going to give you an IRA that says you're low risk, okay? I'm going to help you do an IRA, an honest-to-goodness IRA. And and Attorney Arnold and Attorney Kimi are here. I would tell them, you know, if you are, if you have identified a high-risk rating in your inherent risk, the regulators will not fault you for that. As a matter of fact, Philippines is high risk, right? So it would be hard. It would be hard to say that you're not, right? So really using the IRA as a management tool and not for compliance to submit to AMLC, that is probably one of the areas that a lot of our covered institution should address. Um, I have not seen AMLC um, penalize um, an entity just because they are high risk, right? They would if you have not addressed the high risk. So that tool, if it's still like a, a checklist, no, some 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 entities would have like a checklist type for IRA, but it does not really identify the high risk areas. It might be good to revisit, no, and um, if if you need to ask help for uh, from specialists, uh, that would probably be good idea. Now the transaction monitoring. Now I'm thinking in the next five years, that's the focus of the banks. Because banks are now really actually heavily um, investing in their financial crime compliance. But if you look closely, there are a lot of unproductive alerts. No? They are using a lot of resources because they have a lot of hits from their transaction monitoring. And discounting or reviewing the hits, you know, it takes a largely manual process. Yeah, I know. So that's false positive. But when you think about it, earlier I talked about that the more the, the the higher risk is if your scenarios or rules are not actually identifying the suspicious transactions that's the false negative so i think this is in the next 5 years no i i think that is the focus of the covered institutions looking into optimizing and tuning the transaction monitoring and um we've already had some discussions with the, the bigger covered institutions about these um uh, about this topic no? because it is not just setting up you know, a rule in your system but understanding the risks of the company, looking into data it's really data driven you know? and an iterative process it's quite it's quite mathematics no? statistics and etc but I think that's that's an item or an area that the, the more mature covered institution should be looking at in the near term right, I and hope that helps yeah, definitely. Because from what you were saying, what I was getting is that you shouldn't look at it as if it's just in a box, right? It should be situational. You should treat every case as if it was new rather than just, you know, doing everything that you can to be able to check all those boxes. Now, um, we have a question here from the audience. The question is, have you submitted the SDRs related to tax violations to the BIR? And has the BIR done anything about it, such as filed cases, issued audit letters, etc.? I guess Thank the you. AMLC should answer that. <laughs> so, um, okay. First, we'd like to clarify first that um, STRs are, are not submitted by the covered persons directly to the, uh, the BIR or any other law enforcement agency because it's really just the AMLC who is authorized to uh, receive and analyze those uh, STRs. Now, as to our, um, our uh, whether or not we have actually shared information with the with the BIR. We cannot really divulge that information. However, um, we are able to to emphasize that um, I think it's, it was around one or two months ago we signed already. Uh, we updated our um, uh, existing memorandum of agreement with the uh, BIR, and that that allows us to share information in relation to to uh, tax crimes. We would also like to emphasize that filing of STRs in relation to tax crimes does not mean that those um, the suspected um, tax evasion amount should uh, should total more than twenty five million pesos. No, um, the twenty five million pesos threshold in the um, in the Anti Money Laundering Act is for the AMLC to file civil for feature cases or money laundering cases related to those to, to that unlawful activity. But for purposes of STR, it may be any amount. Um, 
and that's why we also want to to stress that uh, as long as we the covered person determines that there is a possible link to the unlawful activity of uh, tax evasion, then they have to file the corresponding STR. Right. Um, I hope that answers your question, Luis. Now, um, I, I will direct this to anyone. Nika can uh, say her piece as far as the private sector is concerned. And of course, Arnold and Kimmy can answer as well. Do you think that our penalties for violation of the Anti-Money Laundering Act are enough? And the reason why I ask this is because, you know, every country, every culture is based on something. America is based on, is a culture of honor. The Philippines is a culture of fear, which means that when we're scared, we comply. Do you think that the penalties are enough? It's 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 like that. The Jewish um, people are a culture of shame. And the reason why I'm relating it to these is because just to see if what would be a better way of implementing things. Because right now, I'm telling you from a litigator's perspective, I don't see clients, you know, being scared that they're going to be prosecuted for AML, uh, for, for money laundering rather. So I, I ask that question to the panel. Okay. I guess I can take that first. Um, as to the the penalties uh, in in relation to the um, criminal cases for money laundering, no, um, we believe that it's uh, it is um, already sufficient. Uh, we also have to bear in mind that money laundering is a derivative offense. Mm -hmm. In order to have money laundering, there must be an underlying unlawful activity, a predicate offense. So ideally, if we are going to charge a money launder we should charge him both for the money laundering activity as well as the unlawful activity. So in those cases, that person would be would have um, at least two criminal liabilities. If you add in tax evasion, if in case it amounts to tax evasion, that's another case. So we have two or three criminal cases that may be filed against a particular uh, offender. Now, as well, add to that, we already have um, the provisions on civil forfeiture as well as criminal forfeiture, we are able to take hold no, or uh, secure that property for con and confiscate it, forfeit it in favor of the national government, either through a civil forfeiture proceeding or through a criminal proceeding. Uh, and then um, as to the administrative uh, sanctions, well, um, I think it was also discussed earlier by uh, the executive director that before we actually had the rules on uh, imposition of uh, administrative sanctions or RIAS, we sent out um, formal charges to the U, uh, universal banks and commercial banks based on the provisions of that um, previous rule. But um, basically there was a clamor because the, the rates were, were quite too high. Uh, that's why the council um, issued the rules of procedure in administrative cases. And now with the um, issuance of the Council of by the Council of the Enforcement Action Guidelines, we now have a mechanism where we are able to um, to impose reduced assessments at the level of our group, the Compliance and Supervision Group, so that these um, violations will not develop into systemic deficiencies. So if, if we are able to see that um, these are violations. Which are which have been corrected or being corrected by the um, uh, the covered person, and they do not develop into something much more serious. Then there's no need for the filing of the formal charge. Right, but right. It's such an option. Yes. I was just gonna say um, when you were talking about that, uh, what came to mind is the fact that you know in prosecutions and in the determination as to whether or not a money laundering offense has been committed, uh, having good data is essential. Now, unfortunately, there is a saying that goes that, you know, if you punish the data enough, it will give you whatever you want. So do you think from the private sector, Nika, do you think that at this point, we can rely on the data that is provided by the national agencies? Because honestly, if we had, if our data is good, then it would be easy to collaborate and coordinate with the databases of, let's say, the BIR, police enforcement, et cetera. Do you think that at this point we can rely on the data or the lack thereof that is provided? I think I, I think the regulators and the covered institutions um, would agree. And when I say the regulators would agree, I, I can see them talking about this, that there is really a need to improve that. No? 
and if you read their the the statements of AMLC recently, I think one of the remaining or outstanding item that we're working on is the information on beneficial owner, for example. So definitely, because um in EY we I coordinate with other AML specialists in other countries, you know, looking into what are the uh, the 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 data available for covered institutions. That is actually the challenge of covered institutions here because they're already afraid. Right. No, they are already afraid um, to, to the point of attorney Arnold uh, since 2016. Probably before 2016, they weren't. No? But after 2016, I think everyone is afraid. So you are correct there, attorney Carla, that you know um, we respond to fear. But even if they do everything they can, there is really a challenge in data. But um, another perspective on data, no, which I, I think um, one of the messages of um, the regulators is the data also that we feed to them. No, that's there. We also have a responsibility. The quality of suspicious transaction reports no, is also a data that is needed in, in AML. And we too <laughs> contribute to this <laughs> um, uh, lack of quality of data. So Yes, um, but hopefully, but hopefully we should, no, we should improve the data available for covered institutions on beneficial ownership, list of PEPs, etc. Everyone, each company is investing, but actually, as I mentioned, collaboration. You know, like thousands of companies are are paying for a list, but right. can that list be available to everyone? And can that list be relied upon <laughs> even? Because the thing is, one of like it doesn't matter if you have data. If the data is not clean, then that's a problem. And aside from the problem with data, like what Nico was saying, you know, criminals are always a step ahead. If you look at the advent of technology now, AI has been so good that even for, let's say, enhanced due diligence measures where you have to do like a video validation, they can literally create a person. And we have Instagram influencers who are not real people who have 4 million subscribers, et cetera. So that's a problem. But going to enhance due diligence and, you know, when it comes to compliance, you want to balance, uh, you know, our interests in profit and our interests in compliance. Now, um, for Arnold and Kimmy, because we do have a concept, my favorite concept of reduced due diligence. Um, would it be possible to, you know, just have less information if the transactions are like less than 5,000 pesos, for example? Or do we really have to put the minimum um information that is provided in the rules enacted in 20 the amended uh, amendment in 2021 are you in mute arnold yeah um but, uh, yeah well reduced due diligence is all is uh is an option uh the um the covered person may um have or practice in reduced diligence due diligence measures if it involves a low risk um client however for the low risk client there must be a policy it has to be embedded in your mtpp and it would be very very adv advisable that the covered person should first conduct an institutional risk assessment just so that it can determine who are these uh, categories of uh, low risk clients that they they will be uh, for which they will um, uh, be practicing the reduced due diligence measures now so that is okay as long as um, again it's uh, they have it in their MTPP and they already conducted a risk assessment better if it's really an, an IRA so that they'll be able to cover not only the lowest clients but all their clients as well as all their products and uh, all their, their, their service channels, etc. Right. So basically, I mean, with this panel discussion that we've been having, you know, the AMLC, as always, has been doing everything that they can. But we have to take into consideration the fact that it's not just the AMLC who has to act when it comes to this. We still have the police. We still have, you know, the judiciary. We have the prosecutors, et cetera, et cetera. So us not us being on the gray list was a result of different entities involved in putting us still there. So in the same way that, you know, we have 
we want ourselves to be removed, then it requires collaboration among all entities. And it starts with the public. So for your transaction monitoring and for your compliance, it would do well to know what you are supposed to do or at the very least know your uh, limitations and get an expert to do this. So as usual, we are out of time because we always want you to want more. And now I am giving us back to Ronald. Thank you very much to the panel. Thank you very much, Attorney Carr. It's always a treat to have you as a lead moderator. Um, thanks also to our panelists, uh, Nika, uh, Kimi, and of course, uh, Attorney Arnold. And now uh, we would like to turn you over to the chairman of the, the co-chairman of the Professional Development Committee, Paul San Pedro. Paul, you have the floor. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, we learned a lot from our experts today in our effort to deter and detect money laundering and combat terrorist and proliferation financing. We offered webinars such as this to help our members and participants identify strong compliance practices, trends, vulnerabilities, and deficiencies in the area of AML and CTPF. We all know that uh, increase in the general awareness of the nature of money laundering and its pernicious effects when combined with the training of relevant stakeholders can lead to the appropriate level of vigilance. And so on behalf of the Professional Development Committee and Phoenix, I would like to extend my most profound thanks to our resource speakers this afternoon. They surely made a pro profound impact to all our attendees. Thank you, Attorney Matthew David, Attorney Arnold Cabanlit of AMLC, Ms. Veronica Balisi of SGB and Company, our panelists, Attorney Kimi Ross Lino Lat of AMLC, and our moderator for today, Attorney Carla Prias of Bay Law, Law Group. I would also like to thank our partner for this webinar. Without your support, today's webinar would not have been possible. So maraming maraming salamat po, SGV and company. Once again, thank you to everyone who joined us for the last webinar offering of the Professional Development Committee. It was an afternoon well spent, and it has been a great year for Phoenix. Thank you, and we hope to see you again next year. Have a great weekend. And uh, let me take this opportunity to greet all of you. A Merry Christmas and a prosperous new year. Mabuhay ang Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines. Back to you, Ned. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for joining us this afternoon. It's certainly been a pleasure uh, having you. Uh, that ends our program. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Right. Bye. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. <laughs>